Howdy and welcome back. In Activity Overlord version 1.0, the user interface or views of the app were built primarily on the server before being sent to the client and rendered by the client's browser. This approach is the V of the MVC architecture and also known as server rendering, even though the web page is actually being rendered on the client's browser. This so-called server rendering is the server pre-processing one or more templates of markup usually some combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and combining them with data via a template engine. All template engines use some form of tags that surround variables that when processed yield a result. Sales uses the EJS template engine by default. For example, this template contains some standard HTML markup along with EJS tags. Between the tags is a variable title. When the sales server processes this template, it will attempt to replace the title variable with a value, hopefully the page title. This is also called string interpolation, but I only mention that because, you know, I'm a geek. All right, so let's review this approach. When a client browser makes a request to the server, the router parses the request and determines where to send it. Now, the resulting route typically points to a controller action that might execute some logic. For example, that logic might include accessing a Mongo database that retrieves a stored Twitter ID and access token. The ID and token are then used to request additional details of the user from the Twitter API, all before the server pre-processes a template which contains tags with variables that are replaced by the Twitter details in a view. The view is then sent back to the client and ultimately rendered by the browser. Now, this traditional approach to web applications has at least two weaknesses. First, its reliance on the server for page creation means the responsiveness of the app is impeded by the constant round trips necessary to update changes to the view from the server. Second, is that the API being tightly coupled to the view makes it less flexible for other potential consumers to use. A modern approach to web applications solves both weaknesses by pushing the responsibility for changing the UI to the client, as well as decoupling the API to act as an independent provider of endpoints. Now, these endpoints can then be accessed by the browser UI, a native app UI, a mobile UI, or heck, even a smart refrigerator UI. Now, this doesn't mean that we'll be abandoning server rendered views entirely. Instead, Activity Overlord 2.0 will take a hybrid approach using a blend of server rendered views combined with front end framework components to deliver a UI that makes authentication and SEO manageable. But, you know, as usual, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's go back to the project and see what the server render views look like in action. By default, sales generated three files, homepage.ejs, layout.ejs, and a route to the homepage contained in slash config slash route.js. Now, the layout.ejs file is actually a wrapper around homepage.ejs. And what I mean by that is if we look at both files, you can see that layout.ejs contains typical markup that we want for every page, things like doc type, HTML, and head tags. So we have this EJS tag here with a body variable, which when processed by the sales view engine is replaced with the contents of homepage.ejs and the result is our view. Despite its power and to make this example crystal clear, I'm gonna disable the layout functionality in views at least for the time being. And to do this, I'll go into slash config slash views.js and change the layout parameter from layout to false. The first part of Activity Overlord 2.0 consists of the signup page, and when completed, it's going to look something like this. So let's get started. I'll first create a file named signup.egs, and I'll put a simple header in it, signup page. Next, I'll remove the existing route to the home page and replace it with a route to the new signup page. So let's take a look at this in action. I'll start sales using sales lift and then navigate my browser to localhost 1337 slash signup. Okay, good. Here's our signup page. Let's go back to the signup page in Sublime and I'll start by copying in some boilerplate HTML. Next, I'll add our first Angular directives into the body tag, ng app, ng controller, and ng cloak. Let's refresh the browser and see what happens. Well, nothing happens because we haven't yet added Angular to our project. 
We could manually add the script tags that reference Angular. However, Sales can do this automatically for us using its own tagging system. And you know what? It's really easier just to show you. So I'm going to add those tags to signup.ejs, and then I'm going to restart the Sales server using Sales Lift. Now I'm going to go back into the browser, but also open up the browser's console. OK, let's refresh the page and see what happens. OK, that's new. We get this console message that we're connected to sales, but where did that come from? If we look at the page source, I think we're going to get a clue. Towards the bottom of the page, a link to a file named sales.io.js has been added to our signup page. But where did that link come from? Let's go into our project in Sublime and navigate to assets.js. In the dependencies folder, there's our sales.io.js file. First, this file deals with WebSockets and Socket.io, which we're going to be covering in later episodes. The big question now is, how did a link to that file get inserted into signup.ejs? And the short answer is that Grunt did it for us. Okay, so what's Grunt? Grunt calls itself a JavaScript task runner, but really, Grunt is all about automation. It allows you to create repetitive tasks that can be executed automatically. For example, there's a grunt task that's looking for changes in the sales assets folder. Sales creates a .temp folder in the root of our project. As we can see here, any files in the assets folder are automatically copied into .temp slash public, which acts like a static file folder you'd find on any web server. But what about that link to sales.io.js? This is yet another grunt task that will place a link to any JavaScript file found in assets.js that has the corresponding scripts tags we just placed in signup.ejs. So let's go ahead and place the main Angular file in the assets.js dependencies folder, and I'll refresh the browser. Looking at the page source, we can see that a link to Angular has been automatically placed in our signup page. But when I refresh the browser, Angular is mad at us because we have some directives in the signup page without any associated JavaScript files. But not to worry, we can easily fix that. Let's navigate back to the assets.js folder in Sublime, and we'll create a folder called public. Now, we'll put all of our Angular files that have to do with those parts of the application that don't require authentication. Within public, we'll create a folder called signup, and within signup, we'll create two files, signupmodule.js and signupcontroller.js. Okay, first, let's take a look at signupmodule.js, and I'll add the barebones Angular code to define our new module. Next, I'll open signupcontroller.js and add the barebones Angular code to define our new controller. Let's go back to the browser and refresh the page. As you can see, we still have an Angular issue. If we look at the page source, we can see what the issue is. Signup controller is getting loaded before signup module. This is easy to fix and touches on another aspect of Grunt. Most of the configuration for Grunt can be found within the Activity Overlord 2.0 slash tasks folder. For this issue, we're going to look at the root of the task folder for a file named pipeline.js. This file contains the configuration for how the scripts tags are used, as well as some other tags we'll be using shortly. Next, I'll open pipeline.js in Sublime. We want to load the signup module after dependencies, but before any other JavaScript files. So we'll put the path to our file here. Now, when I refresh the browser, Angular no longer complains, and if we look back at the page source, we can see that signup module is being loaded before signup controller. So let's go back to signup.ejs in Sublime and insert the remainder of the markup for our signup page. Let's start up sales using sales lift and navigate the browser to localhost 1337 signup. Although the page loads without errors, there's some obvious dependencies that need to be added in order for this page to look right. First, I'll add bootstrap to the slash assets slash styles folder. Similar to what we did with JavaScript files in the previous episode, sales will automatically include links to the CSS in signup.ejs. Taking a look at signup.ejs, we can see the styles tags that were added when I brought in the earlier markup, as well as a link Grunt automatically created to the bootstrap file I just added. Next, I'm going to create a fonts folder and add some fonts we'll be using later in the interface. I'm also going to add some less files into the assets slash styles folder that we'll be using later in the interface as well. 
You may have noticed the importer.less file, which lets us control which less files are included in the styles tag as well as their order. Note that the grunt task included in sales will only compile the less files that are referenced in this file. I'll also be adding Jesse Rodriguez's fantastic Angular messaging library, Angular Toaster. The library consists both of a JavaScript file and a CSS file. Finally, I'll add the compare to Angular directive, which will help us when comparing the values of form fields. I'll place it in the JS slash dependencies folder. So let's see where we are after these dependencies were added. I'll head back to the browser and refresh the page. Now the console displays an uncaught reference error that Angular is not defined. Since this is coming from the toaster library, my hunch is that we have a loading order error. And sure enough, if we look at the page source, the toaster library is being loaded before Angular. I'll head back to our project and pipeline.js in Sublime and add a reference to Angular here that will load Angular first before any of the other dependencies. Let's head back to the browser and refresh the page. Okay, great, there's no longer an error. Now let's take a look at some form validation in signup.ejs. There are three components to the form field validation we're going to perform. So taking a look at the name field, we first use the ng class directive to create the has error class if the field name is invalid and dirty. This will insert a red border around the input field. Next, we'll configure the validation parameters of the field itself. In this case, we're requiring that the field have a value as well as have a max length of 50 characters. Finally, we'll set up the text for our error messages here. So the title field's configuration is identical to the name. The title is required and has a max length of 50 characters. The email field is required and of course requires a properly formatted email address. The password field is required and must be at least six characters. Also notice that we're using the compare to directive to compare the password field value with the confirm password model. The password confirmation field is also required and must match the password field. Finally, we disable the form submission button via the ng disable directive until all of the form fields have valid values. Okay, let's look at our validation in action. So I'm gonna go back to the browser and refresh. And I'm gonna go ahead and enter in here Nikola Tesla. And if I remove a name, we're gonna see the validation triggered that name is required. So I'll put that back in. And the same for title. In fact, if I just copy this a bunch of times, we'll see that it'll go over 50 characters and trigger the max length validation. And we need a properly formatted email. And finally, our password's gotta be six characters. And we've got a problem here. So this should be triggering our compare validation that's comparing both of these fields and it's not. And I think I know why. I'm gonna go back into Sublime and let's take a look at our module. So we have this compare to directive, but we haven't injected it into our module. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's go back and refresh. And now I'm gonna put in, it is if I can put in a correct password. Yeah, passwords much match. And now that they do match, the validation goes away. Okay, believe it or not, that rounds out our signup page. In the next episode, we'll start to flesh out our initial API that connects the signup page with an endpoint that creates a user account via model into a database. You can find all of the source code for this episode at the Activity Overlord 2.0 repo on GitHub. And if you have a moment, please follow me on Twitter and be sure to sign up for the SalesCast mailing list um, so I can, I can finally prove to my wife that there are actual folks watching this stuff. As always, thanks for watching.